This is CBC Here and Now. Right now, high winds pummeling most of the province. This is what it looks like outside our studios on Prince Philip Parkway in St. John's. And the worst is yet to come. Expect the storm to ramp up even more overnight. And across the province, there was a mix of everything today. Snow, sleet and rain, even some sunshine. But the common element for everyone, the wind. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. The wind is the big blowing story tonight. Absolutely, and it caused problems for the fire department tackling a blaze in Portugal Cove St. Phillips this afternoon. Emergency crews responded to this fire around noontime. The high winds were a worry for neighbors who were concerned the fire might spread, but crews managed to get the flames under control and contained. So this is the scene from Happy Valley Goose Bay. The snow and wind caused school cancellation and delays this morning. And in some places it knocked out power today. Meantime in Gander, wind speed topped 85 kilometers an hour this afternoon. It was so windy, some flights at the International Airport were canceled. So this is a good time to bring in here and now's meteorologist Ashley Brawweiler, who's out in this wild, windy weather tonight. So yeah. Ashley, uh, how is the forecast looking? Well, uh, just about 30 seconds ago, I almost lost my hat uh, <laughs> with these winds gusting out here. I have my anemometer. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll be able to get a reading if we get a nice gust, but we are looking at these winds continuing as we head through the night tonight. Widespread gusts along coastal areas between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour. Some areas could top out at 150 kilometers per hour. A number of warnings in place, more snow on the way as well. I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. Well, there ain't nobody home but these chickens at least for now. There's a coop debate happening in Whitless Bay. I'll bring you that story coming up on Here and Now. Canada Post workers were back on the picket line on the Avalon Peninsula today. It's part of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers rotating strike, which has affected many major cities across the country. Workers in St. John's, Clarenville and 28 other offices were out in the rain and the snow all day. The latest action comes just hours before Canada Post puts what uh, it calls a significant offer on the table. Word of that offer has come in the last 30 minutes. There's no response yet from the union. Cup W wants Canada Post to provide greater job security through the creation of more full-time positions. A golf course and hotel in Port Blandford is in receivership. The Terranova Golf Resort owes $3.3 million dollars and the Business Development Bank of Canada. Accounting firm BDO has taken control of the resort. A spokesperson told CBC News the firm is shutting down the course for winter as usual and looking for a buyer. But there's no guarantee the resort will, will, will reopen in the spring. Well, less than a year before the next provincial election, the president of the Provincial Pro Progressive Conservative Party has quit his job and says he's starting his own party. Graydon Pelly says the PC party under new leader Chess Crosby is going in a direction he can't support. And he's looking for candidates to come aboard and join his NL Alliance party. Pelly says he wants to shake up a political system for people who have lost faith. When we think about a majority government in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we look at it and we say, well, what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that you have a, a, a bunch of cabinet ministers that's making all the decisions and the, the so-called backbenchers are there as just a vote to count when something needs to be pushed through. Naturally, existing leaders are reacting to talk of a new party. They're already criticizing the NL Alliance agenda for being too vague, but they say they're ready and willing to run against however many groups pop up for the next election. Pelly says the party he says he created his party because people are frustrated with politics. Now this is what the current leaders had to say about that. I don't think that that's really the agenda of most people in the province. And when people think about that, think it through, they'll realize that the PC party, I can't speak for the Liberals or the NDP, 
as uh, being in the forefront of democratic advances in this province and in securing for us as a province our rights within confederation. Well, y you have a voice and you know you you will have a, a chance to you know voice your concerns in 2019 we will put forward a message from the liberal party of newfoundland and labrador where it was in 2015 where it is in 2019 i will guarantee you one thing this place is a much better place to live today than it was in 2015 as a result of the work that we've done as a government i i believe that people are looking for us to work together there are 40 MHAs in this House of Assembly. We have to find better ways of working together. Every single person that's in that House, every single MHA, has been elected by the people in their district, and they want us to be working on their behalf. Well, it was a close race, but Paul Din won the Tory nomination for the upcoming provincial by-election. Din defeated CBS town councillor Darren Bent by 18 votes and will now be the party's candidate in the district of Topsail Paradise. Din is a town councillor in Paradise, first elected in 2013. The by-election is being held following the resignation of Paul Davis and has to be called by January 2nd. Andrew Parsons is meeting with his federal public safety counterpart in St. John's this week. And there's one thorny issue that continues to be on the agenda. We're talking about Her Majesty's Penitentiary. There's no dispute that the province needs to replace the 19th century jail, but it costs money to do that. And because HMP also houses federal inmates, the province wants the federal government to pony up some cash, especially now that the Liberals are pushing to get rid of solitary confinement. I don't think they're ready uh, to make any commitment, but I also think they're ready to discuss. They realize this is an issue, and the bill that they have allows for an SI or a, it's a different type of segregation or intervention unit where we need to be able to separate individuals for various reasons, but we need to have the, the confines and the ability to do it properly. Uh, in order to do that, that's going to require funding. Uh, I think there is an obligation on the federal government to work with us. If we can identify uh, a, a good, solid rationale with business plan that will, uh, uh, that will meet both provincial and, uh, and, and federal requirements, um, it's, a, it's a proposition that I'm uh, uh, open to pursuing. A woman in Lewisport is still looking for her relatives in California where wildfires are burning out of control. Megan Janes is sharing pictures of her uncle and aunt, Randy and Paula Dodge, on social media. The couple lives in Paradise, California, a town that has been devastated by the so-called campfire. For days, Janes and her family have been searching and preparing for the worst. They were late evacuating, but their vehicles were there. But that I, I don't know the circumstances of how they left or who they left with. I know that they did try and leave. The house, everything, I mean, I, it's awful. Paradise is basically burnt to a crisp. There's nothing left. A young couple say their town council has made a witless decision. The town of Whitless Bay has ordered them to remove their chicken coop. Now that's despite the fact that there are two other chicken coops on the very same street. But the town says the couple were in the wrong. Ariana Kelland explains why. It's a coop with a view. The reason why Gideon Barker and Jacqueline Humphreys moved to Whitless Bay. Peace, quiet, and a place for the chickens. We have chickens right up the road from us. We live across the street from a farm. Um, there's uh, horses and, and goats there. Uh, so we, we were pretty sure this was the place to be. So in June 2017, they applied to the Whitless Bay Council for a permit, a place for McNugget, bean and lentil. They waited three months, not a squawk out of council. The council was in disarray. They weren't sitting whatsoever, so they weren't able to hold a quorum uh, to actually approve our permit. So without a permit, they built this hen house. After all, these were towny chickens allowed to live in St. John's. But when town councillors settled back to business, they hatched a big problem. The council heard complaints, one from a vacant house, and concerns that these three birds will attract rodents and contaminate water. At the following meeting, uh, contested this point, and we argued it, saying that uh, the whole point is a little ridiculous considering that uh, we're talking about a couple chickens here. Uh, we're not talking about some crazy farming operation. Uh, that seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. The Eastern Newfoundland Regional Appeal Board sided with Whitless Bay. No permit, no coop. 
In a statement, the town says livestock is encouraged, but rules are rules. We were under the full impression that this would be just such a fantastic community to live in. And uh, to the credit of the people here, we have met some of the most amazing people in our entire life in this community. Um, we have also met some of the most backward thinking individuals in our entire life. As for Bean, Lentil and McNugget, the couple says there's no rule that says they have to go. Maybe they'll be a bit free range, like other animals in Whitless Bay. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, Whitless Bay. It's getting late in the year for a horse to still be out in the pasture. But this horse needs a new home for the winter, and not just any home. I'm Zach Gowdy. I'll tell you Bud's story coming up on Here and Now. The Duke of Edinburgh Volunteer Hall of Fame Gala honors exceptional volunteers here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Join Fred Hutton and myself, Chrissy Holmes, on November the 15th for an evening of celebration and inspiration as we pay tribute to this year's newest inductees. For more information or to purchase tickets, you can always check out the website, volunteerhalloffame.ca. Weather update is brought to you by Harvey's Home Heating. Complete furnace replacement if yours cannot be repaired. That's furnace freedom. Visit harveyshomeheating.ca for more. 
Ashley, you're back here in the studio out of the wind. It uh, is a very unpleasant evening out there. Especially with those winds now. These temperatures have dropped. I had a little bit of uh, almost had frostbite on my hands. <laughs> I forgot my You were outside today. for like two minutes. Come that's, on. But that's how quick, you know, when you've got these temperatures dropping down and then the strong winds, wind chills. Uh, are quite high, but cold. or cold, I should say. Uh, but yeah, if we take a look at some of the numbers already recorded today, 120 kilometer per hour gust was recorded about an hour, maybe two hours ago in St. John's. And we're going to continue to see these uh, gusts as we head into the next couple of hours and through the overnight. Anywhere essentially along the coast, um, you will see gusts between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour. And then the strongest winds will be uh, from Twillingate all the way down through to Bonavista, where we could see gusts in excess of 150 kilometers per hour through the night tonight. So no surprise that we do have that wind warning in place uh, along for parts of Central, down through the South Coast, Buren, and then even up through uh, parts of Labrador as well into uh, into the day tomorrow and these winds will continue to uh, stay strong into the afternoon so we'll see those peak wind gusts through the night tonight and into tomorrow afternoon uh, or rather through the morning hours widespread gusts again between 80 and 120 kilometers per hour we'll see some relief slightly into the evening hours for the west coast and eventually towards friday morning for the rest of the province or at least the rest of the island, we'll see some stronger winds along the coast for Labrador into the day on Friday. Ridge of high pressure moves in, we'll really start to see those winds ease, and then the winds will pick up right back again on Saturday as another system moves in for the weekend. So those warnings still, uh, winter storm warnings along the coast and up through uh, parts of Labrador as well saw blizzard conditions for most of the day for Mary's Harbor and uh, we'll continue to see those uh, reduced visibilities in blowing snow tonight uh, for the west coast otherwise that storm surge warning along the northeast coast uh, and that should peak tonight and into the early morning hours coinciding with uh, that high tide otherwise it's blowing snow advisories for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then up through Makovic as well as we continue to see these strong winds so here's that culprit the low pressure system just off the coast now it's going to continue to strengthen as we head through the night tonight that's why those winds are going to pick up but in behind it those snow squalls we're going to see that potential right through uh, the overnight tonight even into tomorrow before that ridge of high pressure moves in uh, but accumulations look quite significant into the afternoon tomorrow another 10 potentially even 15 centimeters of snow with some of these squalls so here's a look at the temperatures tonight staying quite cold minus one again all of that snow expected along the west coast uh, most of it between 10 to 15 centimeters but up through the northern peninsula we could see another 20 centimeters and parts of labrador as well by the time tomorrow morning rolls around but these temperatures are going to still stay quite cold even dropping for parts of the straits st anthony down to minus three again five to ten centimeters in those uh snow squalls expected along the coast otherwise we could see the sun peak out at times through the day but i will have all the details on the forecast looking forward because the first significant snowfall for parts of eastern uh, newfoundland is on the way for this weekend carolyn Thanks, actually. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, fossils from Mistaken Point are going on display at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. It's part of a new exhibit called Dawn of Life, which explores the Earth starting millions of years before the dinosaurs. The gallery will also feature fossils from British Columbia, Nova Scotia, Quebec and Ontario. A preview exhibit opened today, but the bigger permanent gallery will open in 2021. What people don't know about Canada is it's actually some of the oldest exposed land in the world. And what that means is we have a world-class collection of fossils that go back almost uh, three billion years. So this gallery will showcase actually a bunch of fossils from key UNESCO World Heritage Sites within Canada uh, that uh, really started around 450 million years ago. An animal rescue, rescue group says there's a pony on Bell Island in urgent need of help. Bud has a rare genetic condition and the surgery he needs isn't available in this province. That's making it hard for him to find a new home with winter quickly approaching. Here now Zach Gowdy has more. From St. John's, it's just a 20 minute drive and a short ferry ride to Bell Island. But it can feel like a place far removed from urban life. 
like when you see ponies grazing by the roadside. It's gorgeous. Oh, yeah. Hey, buddy. Bud is a six-year-old Shetland Welsh pony, a stud. Rusty with white spots, one eye brown, the other a pale blue. But his good looks disguise some bad luck. He has a special condition called uh, cryptorchidism, which means one of his testicles is dropped and one isn't. Uh, so that makes him special because he can't be placed just anywhere. Uh, he needs to go to a place where there's no other studs and where there's no mares, because obviously we don't want him to reproduce. Uh, his condition uh, is supposed to be genetic, so we wouldn't want to pass that on. That's a big problem because Bud needs a new home. His owner can no longer care for him. Bud is currently out on the pasture, but he can't stay there much longer. The weather is getting too cold. Many horse owners who would normally be willing to foster a pony have mares or studs of their own. So Rescue NL is making a public plea. Right now we're looking for a foster home that would include, you know, a separate stall and a separate turnout. He can be gel uh, with geldings, but just like I said, not, not studs or mares. So that's what we need immediately if we can. And, you know, the faster the better, even, you know, in the next few days or by next weekend, if we can find a place, it would be fantastic. Rescue NL deals with all kinds of animals in all sorts of distress or crisis. That includes large or exotic animals like Jigger, a pot-bellied pig the group has been trying to rehome for more than a year. Bud's housing issues could be solved by gelding, but his condition makes it a risky procedure. This province has no large animal hospital, but it can be done at the Atlantic Veterinary College in PEI. Rescue NL is planning to fundraise, but first it needs to find Bud shelter for the winter. Bud's a really sweet horse, so I think if anyone that's, you know, a, a horse person will be fine with him. Um, but we're just looking for someone, you know, to love him and, and feed him, basically make sure he's healthy and taken care of. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, Bell Island. Well, this valuable oil painting found in St. John's will likely fetch a hefty return. It's by the Canadian artist A.Y. Jackson, a member of the Group of Seven, and it was discovered this past summer during the Consigners Art Roadshow, a public appraisal event. It goes on the auction block on November 20th in Toronto and has an estimated value of $90,000. Media day for the St. John's Edge, and we got to take a look behind the scenes and meet some of the players. I'm Jeremy, and I'll have that story coming up.
they left the city and created a homestead. Steve and Lisa McBride, the homesteaders. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. The St. John's Edge are just days away from the start of their second season, and today the team showed off its roster. With only three players from last year returning, the team will look a lot different. But that doesn't have players or the owner concerned. Now, earlier today, I stopped by Media Day, where the team took some shots and a whole lot of pictures. Jared Ski, Mississauga, Ontario, uh, shooting guard, St. John's Edge. I'm feeling good. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to, you know, chase that ring, get that championship that we all want. You recently spent uh, six days in Grand Falls, Windsor. You you lived in St. John's last year. What was it like to get outside of St. John's and go to Central Newfoundland? Uh, it was a you know really different experience. But being from Canada, I'm always open to seeing new parts of Canada that I've never seen or even heard about. So getting out there was a lot of fun, and the fans you know really showed us a lot of support. And I was really happy that the team got to go out there and bond and had a good training camp. You were one of the original St. John's Edge, along with Des Lee and obviously Carl English. Uh, as three players, that means you have at least you have 11 new teammates. Yeah. How hard is it for you guys to bond in such a short period of time? Oh, uh, yeah, it's funny because earlier on, a couple weeks ago, someone asked me the same question. And when you look back at it, at it last year, I had 26 new teammates. So this year, getting a new 11 to 12 guys is nothing really new to me, Des and Carl. We're just you know trying to help the guys get along as fast as they can, and we're gelling, honestly, pretty good so far. Dave Freeman from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, did two years at Mesa Community College, and then I turned professional. I'm here to do one thing, and that's win the championship. Uh, they put a, gr a good group of guys together: um, Carl, myself, uh, Junior Cadugan, Skeet, uh, Satan, uh, Todd, um, J JN, J Nick. Uh, we we got a group of guys that, you know, only we can stop us at this point, you know what I mean? Um, and Coach Doug Plum has been giving us the tools, the accessories that we need to go out and go to battle. So if we listen to him, uh, sky's the limit. Have you talked to Skeet or Dez or Carl about what last season was like from the fan perspective here? And uh, are you looking forward to playing here at mile one? Absolutely. They, uh, the first thing they said, Gabe, is it's nuts. Um, this is probably one of their better places to play in mile one. As um, uh, far as the fans go, I know it gets ruckus and wild and they like to have fun, so I'm going I'm to enjoy it. Listen, I spent a lot of time and last year I didn't really know a lot about you know, St. John's and the St. John's Edge. I've had a year now where really got to know the community, really got to be a part of the community and you know, really got to understand what the community is expecting in basketball. With that, we invested in the team, we invested in the community, and we had a phenomenal year. We ended up going to the semifinals. Um, I come back now and look around at the team, look what we have here, um, look at what Coach Doug has put together. Um, Carl has worked on this team with Doug. Um, we've been able to recruit and attract uh, some incredible players. So I'm really, really excited and can't wait to tip off um, two Fridays from now. Yeah, things are looking very well. We got a great group of guys there. Um, this couple of weeks is grueling, you know. Coaches killing us and putting it through, you know, your paces because you basically got to fit. I would say six weeks into two when you're implementing all your offense and defensive schemes, and plus you're getting to know each other, and plus we had some changes of players and. So just trying to get it all together. So it's been a very, very intense week. Well, a teenager from Sheshashi got a hero's welcome yesterday. Josh Dyke is an 18-year-old wrestler. He went to England last weekend for an international competition, and he arrived home yesterday with a gold medal. Friends and family met him at the airport in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Here now's Jacob Barker was also there. What's hanging around your neck there? Gold. <laughs> How does that feel? It feels great. I feel accomplished. What is it like to win a gold medal in an international tournament like this? 
inspiring and emotional at, at, at the same time. The way I train, I train it three times a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and one in the evening. What was it like wrestling against people from all over the world? It was tough, to be honest, but like I, I couldn't have done it without Colin Bakey. You were up against a British fighter? Yes, I was. Okay. I gotta, I gotta say, it was tough. To be honest, it wasn't very close, but like he gave me a, a good time, like in a match. You know, yeah. like you know what I mean. As soon as I won the gold, I just like did it just like that, and I, I was very emotional when I when I won it. I'm very proud of him, and he accomplished a lot. He just likes to do stuff he puts his mind to. The community is very proud of him, what he's bringing back, because everyone had hope and faith for him to come back with gold. There, there was no doubt about that. I know, just representing my town and my, and my people and everyone that's here around me. When I went to, to compete, I felt everybody's spirit or energy, and, and I had a feeling that I could do it. What does it feel to be able to represent your community uh, on the world stage like that? It feels great. I, it feels, uh, I feel success and emotional at the same time. And what do you think of this greeting here? Great, good, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Remember, you can watch Here and Now while on the go. We're broad broadcasting live on YouTube. You can also catch past episodes on demand. Just go to YouTube and subscribe to CBCNL. And tonight also on YouTube and Facebook, a special event from CBC Newfoundland Labrador about how we do journalism. And in the audience, our VIP is CBC President Catherine Tate. I'll talk to her about the future of suppertime news like here and now and the relevance of the CBC. And with any luck, I'll still be working for this corporation by the end of the interview. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Here and Now. At the Muskrat Falls Inquiry today, the lawyers continue to hammer away at the idea that government failed to properly scrutinize the massive hydroelectric project before it was sanctioned in 2012. Today, the man who was the province's top civil servant at the time faced some tough questions. Here and Now's Mark Quinn reports. It's one of the themes that's emerged repeatedly at the inquiry. Some lawyers are suggesting the progressive conservative government put too much faith in the information that Nalcor gave it. At one point, inquiry lawyer Barry Lermont characterized the government's approach as naive. 
Did you ever ask to see these external reviews that Nalcor was talking to you about or telling you that they had? I don't recall ever asking to see them, and I believe that we relied upon their briefings to us about them. Yeah. I, I can only say that we felt comfortable and, or, uh, and satisfied with the level of detail that Nalcor was providing to us. Lairmonth also questioned Thompson about a meeting he had with then Public Utilities Chair Andy Wells. Thompson said one of the reasons they met was that Nalcor had concerns about questions the PUB was asking Nalcor. Categorically, absolutely none of your business or government's business mm -hmm. when this matter was before the PUB. Mm -hmm. I suggest that to you. What do you say? Uh, I agree with you in this sense, that uh, we would not have exerted any pressure at all to ask the PUB to conform to a certain line of questioning. Thompson went on to say that he wouldn't have had that meeting if he thought it was improper. Thompson repeatedly described the government and NALCOR as an integrated team, but he said that relationship didn't keep the government from looking out for the interests of the people of the province. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, tonight on Facebook, CBCNL is pulling back the curtain on the journalism we do. There's a live stream of an event called The Story Behind the Story, hosted by Anthony Germain and Chrissy Holmes and featuring several of our CBC journalists. The event coincides with a visit by the new CBC president. Here now's Anthony Germain joins us now live. So, Anthony, what can we expect tonight? Well, I think it's going to be a very interesting thing for people to watch on Facebook or YouTube later, Carolyn. If you're interested in how journalism is done, and if you really want to, in a kind of Wizard of Oz way, get behind the stage and see how the wizard of TV journalism and radio journalism and online journalism works, this is the event for you. So tune in. Uh, our journalistic team, a big one. We've got nine people here, I think. So Fred Hutton, Zach Gowdy, Jen White, Angela Antle, Ariana Kellen. They're going to pick certain stories, and that's just some of them, that they did over the last year that you either saw or heard on CBC Newfoundland and Labrador and how those stories came to be. So that's that event. Hope you can tune in at 7.30 Island Time. Should be interesting. And as you mentioned, the VIP here is Catherine Tate, new president of CBC, and I caught up with her earlier in our newsroom to talk to her about the future of shows like Here and Now. So Catherine Tate, what's your sense of the future of Supper Time News? I think the importance with Supper Time News is and in everything we do at the CBC, it's knowing where our audiences are and what they are wanting to watch or consume. So rather than say it's one size fits all, I'd rather look at every market, every town, every community and say, where is the audience? Are they consuming supper time news? And if they are, let's do our best to keep that service going to them. But if they've shifted to digital or to mobile or to some other platform, we need to be there. Okay. Well, I guess one thing that's true for here and now on CBC and true of our competition in TV, audiences are getting older for supper time news. Uh, they're getting smaller and younger people just don't seem to be pulling in the six o'clock TV newscast. So what kinds of challenges does that present to a public broadcaster that has supper time newscasts right across the country? Well, we're, we're, we're riding two horses. We have all our legacy services, linear television, that appointment TV where you tune in after supper, and then you have the digital side. And the digital side is vast, it's on demand, it's consume when you want it, it's check into your mobile device and see the news. So these two horses are actually running at different speeds and with different cost structures. And the key here for people to understand our challenges at the CBC is we're not uh, competing against um, your NTV. NTV. Yeah. <laughs> That's not our competitor. Okay, we our, feel that way. I'm sure. <laughs> but our real competitors are the global digital companies that are monetizing across vast um, uh, populations. And we really need to focus on how do we um, reach Canadians in the best possible possible way we can with the with the resources that right. we have. So, in my sense, Catherine, is that people still want to see things. So, Bruce Tilly, the guy who's shooting <laughs> us right now, um, if he shoots uh, the after effects of a storm or of an accident or of anything that's visually, people want to see it. Maybe here and now in the future is not where they're going to see what. Bruce is shooting. Is that like am I going to see it on my phone? Is it because people well, still want to see video? Oh no, we're going to video has never been bigger. We know the video is just charging through the the pipes like never before. It doesn't mean that you won't have video. In fact, I say you'll have more video. You'll have right. more stories. You'll have more interpretations of those stories. But you'll find it on a platform 
like a, an OTT platform like Netflix, which we're calling GEM for CBC. And there you'll get all your local news, but you'll also get a right. rich collection of other Canadian so content. So the, is the clock kind of ticking on six o'clock news as we know it? Listen, as I said to you, not one size fits all. I think in the communities where there is a demonstrated audience and an appetite will still be there for Canadians. Last question for you. You have a background, a, a, um, a very storied background for someone who's president of CBC. You've worked in production, you've worked in private companies. A lot of private companies say on the digital side of things, the CBC makes it impossible for the private sector to actually compete because we put so much tax money into cbc.ca. The Broadcasting Act hasn't been looked at in decades. Is there room to actually say, okay, the CBC is not just about radio or TV in law, it is about the digital age now as well? It's funny, I started my career working on the Broadcasting Act. I was a junior policy analyst at the Department of Communication, so it's very, very dear to my heart, this um, policy uh, review that we're undertaking. And the fact that the CBC is actually embedded in the mand in the our mandate is embedded yeah. in the Broadcasting Act is enormously important. Uh, so the question you're asking is, it's, it's, it's a vast issue um, to, the, to questions about regional representation, questions about um, how do we deliver our news service. So we want to be platform agnostic. We want to be able to deliver television, radio, and digital, and who knows what lies ahead. Okay, platform agnostic means the whole gamut. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to usually complete mispronunciation. All right, well, listen, I appreciate your time. I hope thank that uh, as a result of this interview, I'm still allowed to stay here. Um, <laughs> thank you very I'm much. delighted to be in Newfoundland. <laughs> And that was here now's Anthony Germain speaking with the new CBC president, Catherine Tate. Well, now to Calgary, where their Olympic, Olympic dream is about to be extinguished. The results of a plebiscite are in, and the no side wins with more than 56% of the vote. I think it's pretty clear that uh, we saw a clear number. We saw a big voter turnout. And for me, that means that I ultimately take my direction from the citizens. So on Monday at City Council, we will have a little debate, uh, which I anticipate will end in, in a vote to suspend this. The yes side was devastated by the results. Calgary is considering a bid for the 2026 Winter Games. The plebiscite is non-binding. City Council has the final say. It's been a really disappointing thing for us not to be able to find a good solution to this problem. A coffee company with a conscience searches for a way to recycle the plastic bags that keep its beans fresh. But it's more difficult than you may think.
Uh, earlier I was uh, bullying Ashley about uh, <laughs> being cold outside and I said it wasn't that cold but I was just keeping in mind the temperature because I'm not a meteorologist and I'm not even very that very smart a guy but <laughs> No. The wind chill is what kills it. Like that's what cools it all off, right? That's so, right. Yeah, so how cold wind. is it with the wind chill? Is what yeah. I'm trying to get at. <laughs> Long way around. Yeah, we've got temperatures uh, down to the single digits, minus single digits across uh, most of the province. But if we take a look at those numbers, uh, we're sitting around minus one, minus four in Cornerbrook. Factor in that wind chill, though. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that just before. Labrador was sitting at minus 14, minus 27 with that wind chill. And then down through uh, the southern portions of the island, we've got those wind chills sitting around minus anywhere from minus 8 to minus 11 along the west coast. And as I mentioned, that will continue as we head through the night tonight, even those temperatures dropping for parts of the northern peninsula. So uh, looking ahead, though, a little bit, we are going to see a little bit of a break as far as uh, this snow goes Thursday night into Friday, thanks to a ridge of high pressure that will move in. We'll start to see some cloud cover though into the evening hours. Then another round of snow moves in and it looks like it should be snow for the entire island, uh, at least through the overnight and into the beginning of Saturday. Uh, models aren't exact on how much is going to fall as of now, but it does look like a good bet. Parts of the Avalon could see between 15, uh, 10 to 15 centimeters is a good bet. We could see closer to 20 centimeters in some cases. Again, the track of the system, uh, it's still far away. So we'll uh, nail that down as we uh, head towards the end of the week. But that system... Uh, will be uh, quite significant, it looks like, for now. So here's a look at Friday's forecast. We'll see uh, temperatures in the minus single digits again, well below seasonal for this time of year. Uh, that sun should peak out at least through the first half of the day, then that snow moves in. Up through Labrador, temperatures more in the minus uh, mid-single digits, minus 8 in Lab City, Nain minus 8 as well. And coastal areas uh, closer to minus five into the afternoon. So here's a look at that system on Saturday. It will continue uh, to track further east in behind it. We're going to see some more snow on Sunday and then um, another ridge of high pressure moves in, clearing things out for the most part on Monday. Then another one moves in Tuesday. It does look like a very active pattern over the next couple of days, uh, even into next week with one system rolling in after a ridge of high pressure and then another system moving in behind it. So here's a look at the five day outlook for uh, the province. We're going to see those winds pick up on Friday for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Stay windy again on Saturday and then clearing out. We can see a jump in temperatures, though, should reach uh, mid-single digits by the time Saturday rolls around. Sunday will drop again and see that sunshine peak out. Uh, for western Newfoundland, uh, another 5 to 10 centimeters expected tomorrow, along with those gusty winds, upwards of 90 kilometers per hour, 110 for exposed areas. Friday night into Saturday is when that snow will move in, and then again clearing on Sunday. Those temperatures in the uh, minus single digits through the overnight as well. And then into central portions, we are going to see uh, that snow move in again. Sunday clearing skies, minus 1, minus 2 for Monday with snow again uh, in the evening hours and then temperatures for Western Labrador down into the minus teens right through into the early part of next week and then we'll see that for Eastern Labrador as well at least through the overnight. So that's a look at your five day forecast. We'll look at your viewer pick coming up in a little bit. An Atlantic Canadian coffee company is trying to come up with innovative solutions to the plastic waste problem. Just Us Coffee ha can be found in several coffee shops and grocery stores in this province. Now it wants to recycle its coffee bags. As part of our Waves of Change series, the CBC's Sabrina Fabian looks at what challenges Just Us is facing and some potential solutions. So many products we consume every day are packaged in plastic, including your daily cup of joe. Hundreds of thousands of plastic bags like these are going to the landfill every year. Just as General Manager Joey Pituello says plastic is key to freshness. This paper-thin bag actually has three separate layers, two plastic and one aluminum. All recyclable, but not when they're stuck together. Um, to get them apart inexpensively and make it a worthwhile endeavor for a recycling company is is the challenge. Forget the blue bag, this needs to be recycled privately. And for now, no one is taking them. 
Piruello is working with a company, Halifax C&D Recycling Limited, which is considering taking the bags and turning them into plastic lumber for things like patio furniture. It's just us, we're, you know, we're, we're really focused on social environmental justice and that includes obviously sustainability solutions and it's been a really disappointing thing for us not to be able to find a good solution to this problem and certainly our customers, we've heard from customers, it is disappointing for them as well. For now, customers in Grand Pre and Wolfville can bring their bags back here. Pitoello is stockpiling them in a shed until he finds the best way to recycle them. The challenge for Just Us is finding a way to collect these bags efficiently and economically. The coffee is sold in grocery stores and coffee shops around Atlantic Canada and even other parts of the country. So the idea is to get the customer to bring them back to a central location and then transport them back here to the company so they can be recycled. Because we don't necessarily, as a smaller business, don't have the resources to create a whole collection network across Canada, for example. I mean, it's, it's just not a possibility for us, so we're working within our own you know, our own resources to do what we can, but we, there definitely needs to be some leadership um, around this issue. He says government has a role to play to make it easier and cheaper to keep the plastic out of landfills. Sabrina Fabian, CBC News, Grand Pre. Britain is one step closer to leaving the European Union. Prime Minister Theresa May says her cabinet has agreed to a draft of the Brexit plan with the European Union. The CBC's Thomas Dagg reports from London. British Prime Minister Theresa May met with her cabinet ministers today at 10 Downing Street with one big challenge, to convince them that her deal is the best Brexit deal for Britain. The main issue for hard Brexiteers is the reported proposal within this deal to keep all of the United Kingdom in a temporary customs arrangement with the European Union, meaning this country will likely be bound by European regulations for months or years after Brexit. Now, the agreement faced plenty of pushback from conservative backbenchers, but this evening, May emerged from a five-hour cabinet meeting. She spoke for just two minutes to say she's cleared this latest hurdle. She did get the backing of her cabinet. But the collective decision of cabinet was that the government should agree the draft withdrawal agreement and the outline political declaration. Now, May plans to make a statement to Parliament tomorrow. She knows that is the next challenge for her, getting enough votes from her Tory party and the opposition for this EU withdrawal agreement to be finalized in time for Brexit Day next March. There is still plenty of anger among Conservative MPs, with some calling for a leadership challenge. The hardest Brexit supporters say this deal doesn't deliver the Brexit they voted for. The civil war within her party isn't over, but for the Prime Minister right now, this is one battle that she has won. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Well, he's a grandfather, an author, an environmentalist, and an heir apparent. Prince Charles relished it all today as he celebrated his 70th birthday. I got his happy birthday. <laughs> The prince shared his big day with a cast of thousands at this star-studded gala last night. Today, the queen hosts a more formal party at Buckingham Palace. There were parades and cannons in his honor. Charles appeared to lap it up, comfortable being a father of two and grandfather of three and counting. He is the longest serving heir apparent in British history. Well, they've been criticized for being expensive, unattractive, even creepy. Many companies have tried and failed to get high-tech smart glasses into the mass market. Now, a small Ontario company is hoping to change that. And CBC's Diane Buckner takes a look at what it has to offer. I like them. They don't look too bulky. Sean Wise to wants to be one of the first Canadians to buy Focals, a new brand of smart glasses. My question would be, does the holographic image then appear outside of this? A tiny projector on the arm of the glasses sends images to the right lens, emails, texts, maps, weather and more. The Canadian company behind the product believes it's destined to be an international bestseller. The opportunity for this is really you know, a, a global kind of mass market opportunity. We see it as the, the next uh, step in the evolution of, of consumer technology. But we've seen smart glasses before. Swipe down anywhere to go back to the timeline. Google introduced a product called Glass in 2012 and quickly became the butt of jokes. I'm watching videos of idiots wearing these glasses and not paying attention to the world around them. 
Another problem, the product didn't look cool. Really was associated with geek culture very quickly. This technology expert says there's huge money to be made for the company that gets it right. In my view, in terms of wearable computing and wearable technology, smart glasses are the holy grail. Whatever company can get um, consumers to buy and use smart glasses will really make it. At head office in Kitchener, the Focals product has been in development for five years, based in part on learning from others' mistakes. The company has attracted $140 million in investment from heavy hitters like Amazon and Intel, who see the potential. It also lets you stay kind of heads up um, and present in the world around you and, you know, not be that person who's walking down the street with their, their head buried in their phone and almost gets hit by a car because they're just so distracted. Got a bunch of frames on Friday. Privacy concerns could be a stumbling block for Focals. We live in a data sphere that's using our data as a commodity, right? So the privacy implications haven't been explored yet with this new product. We don't know much about it, what that will be like. Oh, now I'm starting to see it. For now, though, the biggest issue is getting more than just tech aficionados like Sean Wise to spend $1,300 on yet another smart gadget. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Well, this shot was sent in a windy day, but beautiful earlier this week. An A idea where this was, it's on what part the, of province? On the Avalon. Could be anywhere. Uh, Topsail Beach, or Director Rod Dobbin says. <laughs> nope, you're wrong. <laughs> I'll tell you where it is when we come after the break. There's the photo again. You didn't guess where it was. Beautiful shot. It is a gorgeous shot. This Cupids. Yeah. No. Avalo yeah, well, good call, I guess. Uh, this was the Argentinian ah, base. Never would have got that. No, nice. never would have got that. Yeah. Gorgeous Beautiful shot thing. there. Derek Scott sent us that photo. Windy day on Placentia Bay. Thank you so much for sending that in. If you have any weather photos you'd like to share with us, send them to CBC, or sorry, NL Photos at CBC.ca. <laughs> and another windy day there today, and another windy day there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. and maybe we'll see some snow. Everyone loves things. Everyone loves when the meteorologist says that there's snow coming. So Do they? Get used I to don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on who that is. <laughs> You'll be very popular. Yeah. Well, that's it for us. Good night, everyone. Good night.